uh, dear students from uh, Taiwan and from abroad. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be able to come to National Taiwan University today uh, to share some of my thoughts with you. Uh, I used to be a professor at National Jiangxi University. And when I went to the university here in Taiwan, I attended Zhenda. Uh, and here in Taiwan, you understand that uh, those who are able to enter the National Taiwan University are supposed to be the smartest here in Taiwan. And internationally, many people also describe the Taiwanese people are the smartest people in the world. And therefore, when I come to the National Taiwan University to meet with the students over here, I'm meeting with the smartest people, young people of the world. And that makes me excited. And that is also a little bit intimidating because I don't know what kind of question you're going to raise uh, to me. Uh, and I'm particularly excited uh, to be able to sit next to uh, Giuseppe Iso, a very good friend of mine who is a former uh, vice chair, who is the current vice chair of the uh, European Chambers of Commerce. And he used to be the chair of the uh, European Chambers of Commerce. And for your information, he is a Taiwanese now. That's great. When I was teaching in National Jiangxi University, I did something different from the rest of the faculty members. The tradition of teaching here in Taiwan is that we continue to teach. We don't allow students to think. But what I did differently from other professors is that I told the students, raise the questions or make statements, and then your score will be higher. And toward the middle part of the semester, I won't be able to stop the students from talking. And that is good. So I will encourage you to raise your questions or make your own statement in the course of the speech this afternoon. When I was asked to make a statement this afternoon, uh, I was told to think about Taiwan's international environment and tell you a little bit about the job as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. This is not easy because the environment that we are in is not easy. It's rather difficult as a matter of fact. If you look at the international standing of Taiwan, we have not been able to participate in major international organizations. We always get squeezed out. And very often when we participate in international events, we get hurdles. We either get our name changed or some of the symbols are not able to come with us. So that is the practical difficulty and probably the first difficulty. And when we see that, it is always the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is trying to assist our participants. And we have been very busy in doing this. And therefore, if you compare Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in other countries, we are very different. We work very hard. We work so much harder than the diplomats in other countries. But we engage in this because we think it is very important to uphold the dignity of this country, to uphold the sovereignty of this country. And other than that, many, maybe many of you would like to ask what kind of policies that we would pursue in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? And this, again, is not an easy question to answer. And in order for us to answer this question well, I think we need to look at the international environment that we are in. If you look at the situation Taiwan is in, we face a very serious challenge coming from the other side of the Taiwan Strait. China is the source of our problems. China has been trying to work very hard in preventing Taiwan from being able to participate in international organizations or international affairs all the time. And that is keeping us all very busy. And other than that, we have not been able to live in the free 
part of the world. The military threat against Taiwan is very serious and it's getting more serious than ever. If you look at the military exercises China has been conducting around Taiwan, they not only engage in surface ships, but also combat aircrafts in the air. And the frequency of their flights coming into our air defense identification zone is so frequent. For last year alone, it's almost, almost 1,000 sorties coming into our southern part of our ADIZ. And it is very intimidating. And if you look deeper into the kinds of exercises they have conducted, I think they are trying to exercise for a real conflict. So the threat against Taiwan is becoming more serious than ever. And if you look at the international situation, I think the environment is not only limited to our surroundings, it's also encompassing the whole Indo-Pacific. If you look at the Taiwan Strait situation, it is quite serious already. I'm sure you will agree with me. But if you look beyond the Taiwan Strait, if you look north to the Eastern China Sea, the Chinese are also sending its surface ships, either Coast Guard ships or military ships, into the disputed water, which used to be controlled 100% by the Japanese. But now the Japanese are sending ships into the East China Sea on the daily basis. And it happened several times that their ships are chasing away the Japanese fishing boats. So you can see that the Japanese government, our good friend, is getting very nervous about the Chinese intention as well. And if you look at the South China Sea, the Chinese government is also violating the international law, uh, especially UNCLOS, by building tiny little rocks into a major island and armed with that island. And if you have some uh, more information about the Chinese activities in the South China Sea, they are sending regularly more than a dozen ships into the South China Sea. And they're sending also their military aircrafts into the South China Sea. So this is a surrounding that we are in. And therefore, if we look at our own situation, we need to understand that our situation is not just our relations with Taiwan, but also a larger picture that China seems to be trying to expand itself into the second island chain or into the South China Sea, even into Indian Ocean. And they also have their Belt and Road Initiative that is reaching out very far into Africa, into some parts of Europe, in, even into Latin America. So many people have started to describe that the world we are in is expanding authoritarianism. And under these kinds of circumstances, we understand the situation Taiwan is in is not only limited to the situation of Taiwan. It's become a global issue for us to deal with. And under this kind of situation, we need to think about how we can cope with this situation. Not just only for Taiwan, but also for our good partners among the like-minded countries. And therefore, we discussed in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also in the National Security Council on what are the best strategies or policies for us to pursue. And I think it's quite easy for us to understand. When we are facing threat, we need to go for friends. I think this is like a real society issue. And the best friends we can have are those friends who are like-minded and those friends who are willing to support Taiwan. And therefore, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have been very busy in building up friendship, better and better friendship with countries like the United States, Japan, Australia, European countries, and et cetera. And in the last few years, our effort has borne fruits. For instance, many people have described that Taiwan's relations with the United States is at its best form. And I can tell you that it's still getting better. Our security relations with the United States have been advancing rather rapidly. And we have also engage in economic discussions or dialogues with the United States 
an economic prosperity partnership dialogue or digital aspect or other aspects. And I think our economic relations with the United States will continue to improve. And our political relations, as you can tell from the high level visitors coming to Taiwan or for those uh, people uh, who are willing to engage us or for those people at the level that they are willing to speak about the Taiwan issue, you can tell that our relations with the United States has been uh, quite good. And it is the same can be applied to other like-minded countries. For example, uh, Japan's officials who are willing to speak out on uh, the peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait has raised to a very high level. And that is to our comfort. And you can tell that uh, the Japanese government officials now, they care about Taiwan, not only about the regular cultural relations or economic relations or regular friendship. They care about the peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait. The same can be applied to European countries. Take myself for instance. Taiwan's Minister of Foreign Affairs usually are limited to travel to other countries. I can visit our diplomatic allies, but I cannot visit the capitals of other non-diplomatic allies. But for the last few years, I've been able to travel and gradually become an open way and last year, I was able to travel to Bratislava, travel to Prague, and to Brussels. And I was able to hold public events and give public speeches. And you can see this is a very good advancement of our relations with other countries. For those countries who are willing to speak out for Taiwan, either supporting, supporting our international participation or advocating for peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait, has been, has been growing. And I can identify some of the high-level dialogues that mention about Taiwan's, or Taiwan's trace peace and stability. You know, for example, in all sets of uh, two plus two meetings between Japan and Australia, between France and Australia, uh, and uh, also the high-level meetings between the United States and Japan, and so, also G7s, and et cetera, and et cetera. Now the common theme in all these high-level dialogues is that they care about peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait. And when they care about the peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait, I think this is a very important deterrence to those who want to use force against Taiwan. And when those people continue to say that they support Taiwan's international participation, especially the World Health Organization, this is also a deterrence, deterrence against those people who are trying to hinder our international participation. So this is the way we do it. This is how the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is handling the issue of our international relations. I know we are not living in a very normal world as COVID-19 is still rampant throughout the world. And we want to come back to normal when the COVID-19 subsided. But other than COVID-19, many people would also describe that Taiwan's international situation is not normal. And I can tell you, yes, exactly, not normal for us to participate internationally. But we want to come back to normality as the theme of your symposium. I think it is very important for us, not just for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but for all the people in Taiwan to think about how we can live in the world in a very normal way. And very often I would tell those senior officials who have dialogues with us, I'll tell them that yes, you support Taiwan. Yes, it is very important for you to advocate Taiwan's international participation because we haven't been able to participate normally in international organizations. But look, even if you support us, international participation or international space, how come Taiwan's Minister of Foreign Affairs or Taiwan's Minister of Defense or other senior officials like the President and Vice President are not able to visit those like mighty countries? And I think this is a very good question. This is not only a good question that we are asking 
in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in order to advance our diplomatic interests. I think this is also a very good question for all of us to ask ourselves to see how we can do it better. And I think there are several approaches we can do at the same time. The first is to tell the international community that we are willing to make contributions, that we are willing to make donations, make charity drives, make anything that will benefit other countries. This is what we do in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well. Uh, I don't have a prepared statement, but I do have something that I want to share with you. We need international support. But I think the international support does not come. We cannot take, granted, take it for granted. It does not come if Taiwan is not a force for good in the world. And this is something for us to know that we need to support others. We need to speak out for others in order to have other friends, other people to speak out for Taiwan as well. And this is something on a monument in Boston, and it's written by a German pastor. It says, they came first for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I did not speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left to speak up. And I think this, is, this says very well on how Taiwan should stand in the international community. Let the international community understand that Taiwan is a force for good. And therefore, when we ask for help, the help will come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Wu, for the insightful speech. And now, we have roughly 10 minutes for the Q&A session. Are there any questions on the floor? The delegates on the side, please. Allow me to adopt the current established protocol. Um, Mr. Honorable Minister, uh, can you please comment on the um, strategic ambiguity by the United States and how Taiwan is um, currently trying to cope with that? Uh, appreciate it very much for this uh, very good question. Uh, there has been a debate in the United States, especially in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, whether they need to pursue a strategic ambiguity or strategic clarity over the issue of their relations with Taiwan. And the debate has been going on for a long time. Uh, but beginning from a couple of years ago, the debate suddenly takes a surge. Uh, they want to uh, pursue a policy of uh, strategic clarity toward Taiwan to provide Taiwan with very concrete assistance, especially the military assistance. They think that ambiguity has already provided too much room for China to expand its influence in the region. And maybe that is uh, giving some space for China to misinterpret that the United States is not going to come to assistance for Taiwan when Taiwan is attacked. So this is the uh, nuances of the debate. But for us, if you listen very carefully to the two sides of the debate, they both support Taiwan. For the uh, perspective of strategic ambiguity, they think that uh, they want to keep China guessing what the United States want to do so that China would not come to, a, that China would not attack Taiwan. But for those who want to pursue strategic clarity, they think they need to let China understand very well that the United States is going to be there when China attacks Taiwan. But no matter what kind of strategy they are pursuing, you know, for us it is very important to know that uh, we have plenty of friends in the United States. Uh, an information for you. In Washington, D.C., there used to be a blue camp, 
and a red camp. Uh, which means that uh, they are supporters of Taiwan and the supporters of China. But after uh, maybe in the last two, three years, uh, we only see friends of Taiwan. And it's happening in the policy community in Washington, D.C. And it's also on the Capitol Hill. And it's also the administrations, the, the Trump administration or the uh, Biden administration. These are all our great friends. Maybe China has done something. China's expansionism or their Malay influences throughout the world. But I think it's also Taiwan. We have become a reliable partner for the United States in uh, the global affairs. And we have also been making contributions. You know, the US government officials have been described Taiwan as this, as democratic success story, a reliable partner, and a force for good in the world. And that says it all. That says about the U.S. attitude toward Taiwan. Thank you. Are there any other questions on the floor? Delegate at the second session, please. Hello? Okay. Um, thank you for that speech. But following up on that question, do you think increased international support for Taiwan would ultimately may escalate the conflict further, seeing as China may want to like um, initiate wartime or initiate conflicts before like in any further international support? Uh, that is also thought-provoking. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was receiving international press uh, interviews previously. Uh, some journalists are also asking the same question. Uh, but I think we need to ask our own self, uh, national interest. When China is intimidating us, when China is threatening us, when China is trying to squeeze us out of international polity, what is the best strategy for us? To me, the best strategy is to make friends, to make sure that the friends are out there when we need them. And of course, China does not like that. China is upset almost at everything. They're upset at me because of me. They're upset at any people who are saying good things about Taiwan. They protest every day. They protest very hard in every capital. So sometimes we should not be over cautious on this issue. We need to identify what we need as our strategic interest. And what we need as our strategic interest is to have more friends, to have more loyal partners of Taiwan. And that is the bottom line for us. And I can tell you that uh, we have been working very hard in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in the last few years. And we, not only the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who are working very hard. In fact, the Taiwanese people are also working very hard uh, very recently, we see an upsurge of uh, COVID situation in our diplomatic ally in Palau. And we have to stop uh, the uh, tourists or the uh, travelers from coming in from Palau. And the announcement was made last night. But we also understand that we need to help our friends in Palau. And therefore, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is making some donations of uh, test kits and also face masks and other materials. And this is not just the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You know, we have limited budget. In fact, I need to uh, run to the LY to defend our budget. And I don't know what LY is going to do to our budget under this current situation. But let me tell you, we have other private organizations that are very willing to help. Uh, for instance, Xinguang Hospital or Xiuquan Hospital. They know that they can help as well. And therefore, they made more donations than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to our good friend, Palau, for them to fight the COVID situation. So this is the heart of the Taiwanese people. And in fact, that is winning the support and hearts and minds of many people around the world. One of the key questions uh, many people in Europe have been asking is, what do we have to do with Taiwan? But many of them have, are coming to a conclusion Taiwan has made donations of face masks. 
to their countries. And they think that it is time for them to donate vaccines to Taiwan. And it is the same with Japan. You know, back in the, uh, 10 years ago, when they had that terrible earthquake and tsunami, the Taiwanese people are making, were making selfless contributions. Taiwan's contribution to Japan is more than the total of the rest of the world. And the Japanese people still remember that. They mentioned that again and again and again until today. And you can see our support for other countries are still very important cause for the international support. And let me give you uh, some terrible uh, situation that we were in. A few years ago, there was also uh, an earthquake in Southeast Asia. And we knew that it's time for Taiwan to help. And we wanted to make donations, significant donations but that was stopped by China. China knows that our charity or our donations, our contributions to the international community is good for Taiwan and it's good for other countries. But it might increase Taiwan's international standing. So they stopped it. And just a few days ago, it's very sad again to learn that we wanted to make another donation to a Southeast Asian country. And it was stopped by China again because they understand that any kind of good works that we do, any kind of international support that we get out of our good doing, is going to make it more difficult for China. And therefore, coming back to your question, whether our good relations with other countries is going to make China more threatening, possible. But we have to firm up our strategy. Our strategy is to make good international relations. And that is our safeguard. Thank you again for the question. Due to time concern, we will end this Q&A session here. Thank you for all the questions, and thank you once again, Minister Wu. <laughs> to show our gratitude, we would like to invite the Chief Director of GIS Taiwan, Yuan Xingwei to present some tokens of our appreciation to Minister Wu. Due to the minister's tight schedule, he would have to leave early. Let's thank him once again with a big round of applause. <laughs>